the 40 Smith & Wesson versus the 45 ACP. Probably one of the two biggest pistol caliber debates out there and we're gonna take it on right now. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Ammo Guides podcast brought to you by your friends at Ammo.com. Now, Chris, today we're going to talk about two cartridges, uh, yep. one of which you are you have a religious respect for. The other one, some respect, but not quite as much. And those, of course, are the 45 ACP and the 40 SNW. Absolutely, Dave. And yeah, thank you for that. And yeah, uh, it, spoiler alert uh, for everybody watching this. I am opinionated on this pro uh, on this uh, this topic of this, this comparison between these two cartridges. And we'll we'll talk about it. It's not just because I love one and I hate the other one, just because there are some reasons behind it. But yeah, 40 Smith and Wesson and 45 ACP, definitely some hard hitting uh, semi-automatic handgun cartridges. Uh, Dave, tell me, have you had experience with either of these? Yeah, the 40 SNW, only as much as you can get from casually firing your buddy's handgun at the range. Gotcha. Uh, the 45 ACP, like any American with a pulse and three interconnected brain cells. I love the 1911, one of my favorite of all times. It's not my primary carry. I would never confess to what my primary carry is in front of so many people, but I will tell you, I've got a really neat double tap Derringer chambered for 45 Ooh. that annihilates the palm of my hand whenever I fire it, but I still love it. I can imagine that might have a little bit of kick to it to say the least. Uh, and, you know, obviously, like you mentioned, uh, the the 45 ACP, probably America's cartridge, for lack of a Without better. question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, John Moses Browning, you know, the, the innovator of so many different firearms and cartridges that, you know, really survived the test of time. And the 1911 and the 45 ACP are two of probably his greatest, if you ask me. Yeah. Without doubt. I mean, you know, I love his 380. I love his 50 oh, yeah. BMG, but the world would be a much poorer place without his 1911 and the cartridge created for it. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, Dave mentioned that I have a pretty big following for one of these, and I'll admit it right now. It is the 45 ACP is, is my preference. Uh, I've actually built a 1911 before uh, from parts. It was a really fun project. Uh, it definitely gave me a healthy respect for the amount of engineering and ingenuity that went into that handgun. Yeah, the man knew how to design a piece. He definitely did. It is definitely nothing short of a, a work of art, uh, in my opinion. But, you know, both of these calibers really effective at uh, whatever you need. Uh, we mentioned concealed carry. Both of them will do an excellent job. Home defense. Uh, of course, the U.S. military used the 45 ACP for many years, well over 70. And, uh, of course, the 40 Smith & Wesson, very popular in the law enforcement community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cops are pretty, pretty enthusiastic about the 40 S and W. It boils down to nine mil or 40 S and W for them, and the 40 just provides that extra punch. I had one of them explain to me that the uh, the rise in recreational drug use actually contributed to their their favoring a more powerful pistol cartridge. Oh yeah, I have no doubt somebody hopped up on PCP. Uh, you know, it might not be feeling a nine millimeter as much as a 40. That's for sure. Yeah. And to be sure, it's not just the uh, the energy difference between the 9mm and the 40. You've got a bullet that's that's significantly broader in diameter. Oh, like definitely. Bullet diameter is a pretty interesting thing that separates these two from the from the vanilla 9, as we call it. For sure, for sure. But i got to say, that's probably going to be a topic for another podcast. But uh, I think that'll be a good one, too. I've got opinions there on that one as well. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll get to that one later. Today, we're going to keep it, uh, you know, focused on the 45 and the 40. And, uh, you know, I think probably the biggest difference uh, between the two, you already just alluded to it, is just the bullet diameter. The 45 is just a bigger bullet by, you know, uh, five hundredths of an inch. And... Does that make a difference? I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yes, it does. Yeah, I'm right with you. I mean, even if the bullet doesn't expand, which would always be the case in, in when it comes to military ammo, um, an all 45, 0.45 inch diameter wound channel is just that much more debilitating than a uh, 0.4005 inch wound channel. 
Definitely. I mean, you know, when you're trying to, you know, have deeper penetration and make and you don't have expanding ammo like our military does, uh, having just a bigger hole. Uh, is kind of what you need. It increases your chances of debilitating your target uh, or incapacitating your target, excuse me, and uh, gives you a better chance for hitting where you need to hit. Yeah. Now, I understand a 45 HCP's trajectory is a little steeper than a 40 S and W, which is probably going to give people a little bit of a harder time hitting their targets. Yeah, I mean, definitely at range, the 40 is going to be a lot flatter uh, of a trajectory. Uh, the 45 will drop off a lot more, especially because those 230 grain round noses like I've got right here, that 230 grain bullet is actually subsonic. Uh, when it's fired, uh, it's a very low pressure round, only 21,000 PSI, which for hand and handgun rounds is pretty, pretty light. Uh, but yeah, that, that 230 grain full metal jacket, it is, it's going, it's fat, it's heavy and it's, it's slow, but that, yeah, that does a lot of damage. I, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it really hits hard. Yeah. Well, impact energy is simply, uh, the product of velocity and weight. And when you're talking about a half pound bullet, there's only so much good it can do to its target. A half ounce, sorry, that was a very <laughs> dumb thing to say. A half ounce bullet can only do so many things to its target. None of them are friendly. Exactly. We'll, we'll get to battleship calibers later, okay? All right. Well, well, I was thinking turn of the century elephant gun calibers. <laughs> with a half pounder. Oh boy, that's some recoil, let me tell you. Uh, but yeah. You only got to hit your target once. Right. Uh, he'll, he'll never forget when he got hit with the half pound projectile. But yeah, <laughs> a, a half ounce is nothing to mess with. There, that is for sure. Uh, and uh, it definitely imparts a lot of kinetic energy into the target. And I think one of the, the major benefits of the 45 is it doesn't over penetrate, which is, you know, something that a, uh, a shooting instructor told me once is like, if you're ever in a self-defense situation, you have to understand every bullet you fire has a lawyer attached to it. Mm. Uh, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, people often overlook the the utility of a jacketed hollow point. Mm -hmm. It's going to transform more energy outwards. It's going to create a wider wound channel. But it's also going to anchor itself within soft tissue to reduce the chance of overpenetration, which could very easily kill someone and has definitely the last thing you want uh, if you ever have to draw your firearm in self-defense is to injure an innocent bystander or cause collateral damage that way because you're going to be liable for that so that's why you know one of the cardinal rules of gun safety is know what your backstop is know what is behind your target because you're going to be responsible for that bullet and jacketed hollow points are definitely something that you need to have if you're going to have a concealed carry weapon or you know home defense weapon the last thing you want is for that bullet to leave your property mm -hmm. you're of course talking about lieutenant colonel jeff cooper's fourth rule of firearm safety absolutely absolutely that, something that'd to, be worth a whole podcast too right i We'll, we'll send that to the powers that be upstairs and see if we can't get that, uh, you know, scheduled here soon. Yeah. But the the 40 is moving a lot faster. Uh, it is well over supersonic and uh, quite a bit heavier on the pressure as far as that's concerned. Looks like 35,000 PSI compared to 21,000. So, you know, a good rough math, 50% more uh, pressure on the yeah. 40. It's going to it's going it's booking. So right away, that's the key difference. It's lighter yeah. bullet, higher muzzle velocity. Exactly. So with your your forty fives, you're typically shooting, you know, either to if it were talking jacketed hollow points, maybe a two hundred grain jacketed hollow point, or you can go as light as a one eighty five. Uh, with uh, forty, it's uh, one sixty five and one eighty are the two popular uh, loadings for that caliber. I mean, all handgun cartridges were developed with combat in mind, but I've always yeah. found the forty S and W fascinating because really one particular FBI altercation kind of spawned its development. Yeah. And uh, Dave's talking about the 1986 Miami shootout uh, where uh, the FBI was engaged with uh, two bank robbers, actually. And uh, they had gone on a spree. They had killed a few people, if I'm not mistaken, and they get into an altercation. And this is probably the most researched law enforcement shooting of all time. Uh, this yes, is safe to say. Yeah, they have worked this thing over. They've looked at it at all angles. Uh, it was a case where actually two FBI agents lost their life and five were injured, but they outnumbered the shooters two to eight. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So it was a huge, uh, you know, differential in firepower. But what they discovered were was that at the time, uh, the nine millimeters and 38 specials that the FBI agents were carrying were insufficient at stopping the threat, which spurned the, the uh, you know, the genesis of the 40. Yes, and I believe that the crooks in question had uh, semi-automatic rifles and 12-gauge shotguns. They? they did. Yeah, they were they were armed pretty well, uh, that's for sure. And the, the FBI was definitely outgunned, even though they had them outnumbered. And so this kind of moved the FBI to first adopt the 10 millimeter, uh, which is actually, as you mentioned earlier, Jeff Cooper, this is his round. He had a hand in developing this. And uh, I know uh, our Sam Jacobs is a huge fan. Uh, of the 10 millimeter. Uh, and that thing is a house. Yeah, he loves it. Um, it's great. I, I kind of share my cop buddy sentiment. I have a, I have a cop buddy mm -hmm. who, when he started out, I was all eager about keeping a 10 millimeter, carrying it. But uh, this guy's no hothouse flower, but he still had trouble controlling it well enough to be confident out in the field with it. And he moved down, as he said, to a 40. And that's actually what happened with the FBI. They're like, okay, we need this big, powerful, hard-hitting round. And they got it with the 10 millimeter. There is no doubt a 10 millimeter, it, it hits harder than a 45, uh, you know, yeah. in my opinion. It, it it's is. a cannon. Oh, I yeah. mean, for reference, for reference, uh, I know Nordic, Nordic law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. keep 10 millimeters to deal with polar bears. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Pot it's potent bear medicine. Uh, the most, uh, the highest selling Glock actually in uh, Alaska is the Glock 20, which is the full size 10 millimeter. That's uh, so interesting. Yeah. Uh, by far and away the most popular handgun in Alaska. So that tells you this, this is some, some powerful rounds, but so the, they go ahead and went with it. They went with a 10 millimeter and they found that their agents were having a hard time qualifying because the round was so powerful. Yeah. And, no, yeah. I'm sure Officer Beef. I'm sure Agent Beefcake had no problem with it, but Agent Pencil Wrists just couldn't do their job. Absolutely, and I mean, you know, not everybody is, you know, an Olympic weightlifter uh, or you know just jacked up and can handle all that uh, that recoil. And it is stout. Uh, it is very stout. It's got a lot of power behind it. And so, what actually happened was one of their training agents by the name of John Hall, who is a reloader. So, of course, I love him already. If that's the case, <laughs> uh, he was like, "Hey, why don't we just decrease the powder charge?" Which is, you know, pretty smart if you ask me. It's like, okay, this is kicking too hard. Let's pull back. We're not going to cut the uh, the bullet back down to nine millimeter because we're like, well, that would just be going back to what we had. We can't do that. So let's just tune it down a little bit. And they found out that this was actually a lot more effective and the agents were able to control it a lot better. Yeah. So the 40 S&W is really just a, uh, it's, it's almost like a light 10 millimeter load. If they hadn't touched the case at all, it yep. would be more of a, uh, it would be like going from 357 to 38. Pretty much. Uh, and uh, that's a really good analogy. Uh, obviously, the 357, definitely a hard hitting revolver round and 38. Lots of people love shooting their 38s. They don't, you know, are not too excited about shooting 357 all day at the range. The same thing can be said about 10 millimeter and 40. Uh, but what actually happened was the FBI contracted Smith and Wesson and Winchester to go ahead and make this new 10 millimeter, what they coined the FBI load. And then uh, through testing, uh, Smith & Wesson said, hey, why don't we just chop off three millimeters of case length? And voila, we have the 40 Smith & Wesson. God knows how much brass they save from doing that. Right. I mean, think of all the materials cost. Uh, how many extra rounds could they make from that? I'm sure that the bean counters had something to do with that as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think probably the, the most iconic 40 caliber uh, has to be either the Glock 22 or the 23. And it's interesting because Smith and Wesson makes the round. They know it's coming out, but yet Glock beats them to the market by at least a week uh, after mm -hmm. the round is unveiled, which I think is just comical. You know, Glock was ready to go. Yeah. I mean, they knew its its uh, impact on the LEO community. and They already knew that they were pretty highly favored by them. Oh, yeah. They were smart to move fast on that one. Interestingly enough, Glock kind of uh, kind of ruined Sig Sauer's plans to introduce the 357 Sig oh, yeah. by beating them to the punch with the 40 by a few years. But that's another podcast. It is. Yeah, the 357 Sig is another interesting caliber that uh, we'll have to talk about here fairly soon. I, I, it's, it's, very, it's a very different type of pistol round, and I'm excited to talk about that one. 
Getting uh, pistol round with a bottleneck wins my heart. Right. We're digressing. Yeah, for sure. But we'll get to that. Uh, but uh, OK, so let's talk about, you know, kind of some of the differences in the two calibers here. We've talked about the history a little bit. Obviously, the one thing we didn't mention, the 40 is actually not seen military service. It's pretty much strictly a civilian and a law enforcement round, uh, whereas the 45 has a rich military history from World War One all the way through Vietnam. Yeah, that's a pedigree. I believe uh, our armed forces started transitioning to nine millimeter in the mid 80s. Yeah, yeah. When they went to the uh, the Beretta M9. Uh, and now, of course, the uh, six hour P320 is our standard issue sidearm. Right. So uh, and I know that when they were looking at new handguns, uh, the military, they did consider the 40. I heard that there was some talk about that, but they eventually stayed with the nine millimeter, probably because of their connections with NATO, if I had to guess. Yeah, absolutely. So, that was it. but uh, yeah, even even now, uh, even though it, the forty five is not the most uh, it's not the most common cartridge uh, for our military, there are some spec ops groups that still get access to it because well, they know that it hits hard, and yeah, that is you're not going to tell them what they can and can't bring. Yeah, they pretty much have a blank check from Uncle Sam when they what they say we want this, they're going to get it. They always get the exceptions. Like you'd love to yep. say three hundred AAC blackout has never been used in combat. But black mm-hmm. op guys have. Oh, yeah. And that goes for a lot of other rounds. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. And we'll get to those. I have no doubt. Uh, but I think the biggest thing, and this has to be the one thing that really pushes me over the edge with the 40, is the recoil. I mean, it is snappy. If you've, you mentioned you fired it with your buddies, for me, I can really feel the difference between a 40 and a 45 in terms of recoil. Dave, what's your experience with it? I mean, look, I got to save face here and say that the 40 s and w's recoil is manageable yeah there's other rounds i'd rather spend all day firing but Hmm. you can you can absolutely put every round in your magazine on target quickly once you've adjusted and adapted to its recoil that said for for just a recreational round um you'd either want to go with light loads or or maybe consider moving down if, if target shooting is your priority and not necessarily with any particular cartridge 40 has some snap Absolutely. I, you know, I don't want it to make it sound like we're shooting, you know, 45 Magnum or 454 Casul or something like that. It's it's not that powerful, but it is, it's got some power behind it. And if you're not ready for it or you're a new shooter or uh, if you're using a, a really light firearm, it can be very difficult to handle if you're not prepared for it and you haven't had the training uh, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, of course, carrying a heavy firearm that can absorb so much recoil isn't a very appealing prospect to the EDC crowd. Exactly. And I think that's one of the biggest things that a lot of new shooters uh, maybe don't consider is that the size of your firearm matters quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's so important. I mean, you look at these, these. Uh, I mean, case in point, the, the, the Barrett M2, I'm forgetting the name of it, the, you know, the 50 cal oh, yeah, service yeah. rifle. Mm-hmm. That, weighs, that weighs 30 pounds, I believe. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of it is just there to to cancel out recoil. Yeah. Uh, And I think, you know, I experienced this when I started carrying for the first time. I got uh, this tiny little uh, Taurus 709S and uh, didn't have a lot of money at the time. It was not terribly expensive. And so we got it was probably the most picky firearm I've ever had in terms of ammunition. That's another Hmm. story. It was a nine millimeter and I found it uncomfortable to fire. Of course, I was a newer shooter at that time, so I wasn't prepared for it. Now, uh, you know, I I do carry a subcompact uh, nine millimeter like Dave. I'm not going to tell you all what it is, Uh, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like you go to the range and let's say maybe you rent uh, a Glock 22. Right in cal in uh, in forty, and you're like, oh, this isn't too bad. This is pretty easy to handle. Might as well just go get myself a Glock twenty seven. It'll be the same. No, it's not. It's going to feel completely different. Mm-hmm. And, and the recoil energy is is one hundred percent a product of uh, muzzle velocity, bullet weight, propeller weight, and firearm weight. Yep. And and firearm weight is really the thing you can control outside of which kind of ammo you buy. Exactly. And I think that's something that a lot of new shooters may not take into account. So I wanted to talk about it here. Uh, If you're considering a 40, just my recommendation, go to a range, rent what you want to buy before you do it. You can save yourself a lot of heartache down the line. Let's let's touch on ammo availability and and your options, because Mm -hmm. 
like 45 ACP for as long as, as guns exist, there's going to be uh, people with that religious respect for it. Like you have, Yeah. there's, there's always going to be at least some ball 45 ACP at your corner gun store. Mm-hmm. 40 S and W is not some kind of oddity, but I've just found it a little less easy to find. Have you had the same experience? Yeah, I think so. Uh, definitely. You know, last time I went to my LGS, my local gun store, there was definitely plenty of 45 on the shelf. Not as much 40. Again, it's not like it's some, you know, obscure caliber that you have to, you know, wildcat out of another cartridge. But mm-hmm. uh, it, it's definitely not as popular. And I kind of feel like it's it's starting to fall out of favor because a lot of law enforcement agencies are moving back to the 9 millimeter. Yeah, that's been a trend with them lately. So if you're just thinking in long term, I think you're you're always going to have an easier time finding 45 ACP. And this is probably a conversation we wouldn't have had if not for the events of 2020. But oh, yeah. we did have a lot of people who were uh, unhappy that they were unable to find less popular handgun cartridges. Definitely. It has been a problem. I think it's slowly starting to get better, but definitely not at the rate that we would like. And don't even get me started on the price of primers right now. Uh, that, that's, oh. oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, first you need a Ouija board to find them in stock. Yeah. If you're lucky. Uh, and then then you got to be the first one to get there because if you're not, whoever gets there first is going to buy them all. Buy every single one. Yep. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Uh, And so, yeah, uh, ammo availability is definitely something you need to consider. Uh, And since more and more agencies are moving away from the 40, I'm I'm concerned that we may see less 40 made because there's going to be less demand for it. Yeah. I mean, the LEO community is always going to really control what what manufacturers turn out. Oh, yeah. And if their demand for 40 S&W goes away, just not sure what's going to happen. So it's always going to be around. Um, like to, to bring it back, we saw this with the 357 SIG. Mm-hmm. A lot of LEOs adopted that as their official department cartridge, but they've nearly all abandoned it now. And finding 357 SIG is like trying to find uh, some rare insect on occasion. A uh, needle in a stack of needles. Yeah. All right. So let's say we can get our ammo, you know, which, you know, is going to be the better choice for, you know, home defense, uh, concealed carry in terms of, you know, penetration, magazine capacity. And this is something I think we could beat to death. Uh, And I think you can argue it from both sides of the aisle, if you ask me. I think you could. I mean, always keeping in mind that we're splitting hairs at some point. Oh, yeah. Hit your threat with either of these rounds and uh all you got to do is make a phone call at that point, really. Definitely, no. And I think that brings up a, a big point because a lot of people are like, oh, the 45 has more stopping power or the 40 has more stopping power. And that's really kind of a ubiquitous thing that you hear about on the Internet that isn't really quantifiable, if you ask me. Yeah, enthusiasts hate the phrase stopping power because it suggests yeah. there's some kind of quantifiable, measurable thing about a cartridge that determines how effectively you can neutralize a threat there really is no such thing and you live in a world where people have killed grizzly bears with 22 long rifles Mm -hmm. uh it doesn't take aim into account whatsoever and that's 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 a big thing to not take into account as i always like to say a nine to center mass is better than a 45 to the hand true very true. And so it really comes down to shot placement. Uh, that, that's that's true stopping power. Stopping power is connected to you and how good you can aim and under pressure. Uh, and that's definitely yeah. not something to be taken uh, you know, lightly. Have you ever seen the man with the golden gun? Oh, of course. Remember his little, uh, his little derringer made out of a cufflink and a pen and a cigarette lighter? Mm-hmm. That was chambered for 22 short, I believe. I believe and so. Was, and he was the world's most prolific assassin. I know it's fiction, but... There's still some truth in it. No, it really is. Uh, and yeah, if you can put your bullets on target, that's infinitely more important than what caliber you're actually shooting. So, uh, you know, in terms of penetration, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of difference. Now, you know, maybe back in the day, uh, and I think this is something we kind of need to quantify because, you know, hollow point technology has come a long way since 1986. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's it used to be a big difference. And I think that's why the 40 needed to happen. Uh, you know, nine millimeter hollow point technology was not where it needed to be uh, to be as effective as they wanted. Of course, that's changed, you know, in the last 40 plus years. All right. OK, my on 
screen math is not good enough there. It's it's just short of 40 <laughs> years. Uh, so oh. my, my mistake on that one. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I think back in the day, you kind of needed that extra power and that extra penetration to make sure you got deep enough and you, you know, you had the expansion that you needed. I don't think that's really the case anymore. <clears throat> no, I kind of agree with you there. I mean, uh, so much of the conversation revolved around the efficacy of hollow point bullets. And that's kind of a, an enduring subject among enthusiast circles, but oh, yeah. it's becoming more and more moot as even, you know, even lower quality manufacturers consistently turn out bullets that can expand right on cue scientific accuracy. Oh yeah. Reliability, I should mm -hmm, say. Mm -hmm. No, I think probably one of the most interesting one, have you seen the, uh, what is it? Uh, the RIP rounds? Yeah. Those things are, <laughs> those, are ridiculous. those are ridiculous. <laughs> it's, so it, it, it's, it's like jamming a blender into the guy. Yeah, it is. It's kind of humorous. Yeah. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll fly up an image on screen for you guys. If you're not familiar with the, I believe it's G2 research, the, the RIP round. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. That's a solid copper bullet that basically mm -hmm. explodes in a flurry of knives when it enters soft tissue. It does, but it doesn't have the penetration. That's my biggest problem with it is it, yeah, it, you have this gnarly looking, uh, you know, display on ballistics gel, uh, but you just get like this tiny little thing that does all the penetration. And honestly, when you're in a situation like this and you need to stop a threat, you need something to penetrate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the two most popular hollow point bullets in law enforcement are the uh, Federal HST yep. and the Gold Dot, the Spear yep, Gold Spear Dot. Gold Dots. And, yep. And either of them are very traditional looking hollow points. The Gold Dot has a bonded jacket, which really helps with that weight retention mm -hmm. that we're talking about. The HST doesn't have a bonded jacket, but the core and jacket are so well anchored to one another that it gets away, it gets along just fine without it. But uh, definitely, I think. I'm, I'm going off topic to some degree here, but traditional jacket of hollow point design has, has become ultimately effective with all the advances in technology we've had over the past few decades. Definitely. They they definitely have this kind of narrowed down to a science and sometimes some places try and reinvent the wheel and that's okay. You know, we need innovation, but I think, you know, when it comes to modern hollow points, for the most part, you should be able to get the penetration and the expansion and the weight retention, as you mentioned, that you, that you need to make sure that you can, one, not over penetrate, and two, penetrate deep enough to reach those internal organs to incapacitate the threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the FBI says the ideal penetration depth is, uh, what, 16 inches, give or take two? I forget. Yeah, I believe it was, yeah, it's, uh, memory serves, it's 12 to 18 inches is the range that they want. Uh, okay. It, anything over that is too much, and anything under it's not deep enough. Yeah, and, uh, you know, they test through, like, denim fabric, and mm -hmm. I think even sheet metal and safety glass, and... Uh, yeah, all the bullets are, are performing very well at that now if they're designed for self-defense. Definitely. So it's pretty much a wash as far as that's concerned, if you ask me. The one aspect where, you know, the 40 clearly defeats the, the 1911 is magazine capacity. I uh, thought you were going to say that. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's no two ways around it. Uh, your, your 1911 is just a bigger bullet. And uh, unless you've got, you know, a broomstick sticking out of the bottom of your, your firearm, you're going to have less rounds than a than a 40 because it's smaller and they can just pack more into the magazine. Mm hmm. Yeah. Then that, you know, I think that's enough to rightly persuade people to go for the smaller round, just having more shots at your disposal. When you're in a high stress self defense scenario, you cannot count on having the same kind of aim you would have at the range. Yeah, that adrenaline dump will do a number on your fine motor skills. Uh, and I think they said, I believe the most recent studies for like uh, LEO shooting reports was combat accuracy was about 20%. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's amazing. So don't, uh, you know, if you're a bullseye shooter, well done. Uh, go out, smash those competitions. But when you have that adrenaline dump and you have your heart pumping at about 100 miles an hour uh, and you're in a life or death situation, it's you're probably not going to have that same, you know, breath control and perfect trigger squeeze like you do on the range. Yeah, plus targets aren't lurching around and trying to kill you. Now yeah, that definitely makes a thing too. Uh, so just to hit on the magazine capacity, uh, just a quick uh, couple numbers here. Glock 22 magazine, which is the 40 cal, going to hold 15 rounds plus one in the chamber. 
Glock 21 is going to be 13 plus one. Uh, and then if you love to carry my namesake, which would be the 1911, uh, seven to eight rounds, depending on what type of magazine you have. Now, of course, they have extended magazines for those as well, but not as practical, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. And if you go to an even smaller 1911, then you're going to have well, fewer rounds. Carrying a full size 1911 can be a little bit cumbersome for EDC, especially if you try to conceal it, right? Oh, yeah. I would say the 1911 is pretty decent for uh, concealment because it's so thin. It's a single stack, uh, which is why I can only carry seven to eight rounds, uh, whereas the Glock is a double stack, meaning that they alternate in the magazine at a diagonal back and forth so you can cram more in there. Uh, but definitely the weight on a 1911 is it's nothing to mess with. You got to have a solid belt and a solid carry system if you're going to EDC a 1911. Yeah. And it's good if you run out of ammo, you can just hit the guy with it. It does make a very effective club. Uh, I'm not going to lie. That uh, that steel definitely hits harder than a polymer frame. That's for sure. <laughs> that's a good point. Definitely, definitely. So, you know, it really comes down to kind of what you can shoot best. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. If we're going to talk about, you know, home defense and, uh, you know, uh, EDC, things like that, you need to be able to hit where you're shooting at. Uh, and there are a lot of those ride or die 45 folks that are like, you, you should never carry anything less than a 45 because it has that ubiquitous stopping power. Uh, and then, you know, you've got your 40 people who are going to be like, no, I want more rounds because who knows how many threats I'm going to have to engage, things like that. And it really, guys, it comes down to you need to be able to hit where you're shooting at. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which so much of that just, you know, you can research this stuff and listen to the, the handsome experts like us blather all day long, <laughs> but ultimately that hands-on experience, yeah, that's that's all that matters. Definitely. So make sure you're getting out the range, guys. And uh, if you need ammo, make sure you check down below, guys. There's a link there to our newsletter. We're going to get you a $20 off coupon your next order. So make sure you get in on that if you haven't already. And uh, we talked about this final issue here I want to talk about. And this is one of the things that, that kind of pushes me away from the 40. But for people who only shoot factory ammo, it's not going to be any issue at all. Reloading for the 40 Smith & Wesson can be problematic if you are using an older style Glock barrel. Uh, we have what's referred to as the Glock bulge. Uh, and... It's not that bulge for all of you who are thinking that, uh, wearing it, you know, appendix carry. Uh, it's actually because the uh, the barrel is not supported as well as it needs to. The cartridge, excuse me, in the barrel is not supported. And what can happen since the 40 is so high pressure, it can actually deform the brass near the head, which is the part where the, uh, you know, the back end, basically, not the business end. And then if you reload it and you don't deal with that bulge, you've now got a weak spot in your cartridge, you can have uh, either a case rupture uh, or case head separation, both of which are bad, uh, can cause you know damage to you, can blow up your gun. Basically, bad things can happen. Uh, and this is one of the things that really kind of made me, you know, kind of think twice about getting a 40. Hmm. Yeah, well, you have such a unique perspective on it as a hand loader. I yeah. mean, most people don't give a fig about mm -hmm. the condition of the cases that get spat out by their semi. But uh, that is something to consider, especially as uh, you know, brass becomes increasingly valuable as copper supplies dwindle. Definitely. And you know, it, it a lot of people make a big deal out of it on the internet, and maybe I'm making more out of it than it needs to be. If you're concerned about it, uh, it's very simple. You can get an aftermarket barrel for your Glock. And this is specific to Glock, by the way. Uh, you can get an aftermarket barrel that has a fully supported chamber. You should have zero issues at that point. I feel like this is such a, a small little side note, but maybe one we should include to people who are new to 45 ACP. Mm -hmm. You might encounter a round called 45 GAP during uh, your search. Mm -hmm. That's its own special thing. Glock created that to try to replace the 45 ACP, yep. and it never caught on. Yeah. They still make it in very small quantities. The main thing you should do is avoid it if you want 45 ACP because they're not interchangeable. That's a very good point. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of equated it. Here's here's my theory. I don't know if this is true or not, but I figured that Glock saw SIG make their 357 SIG, and they're like, dude, we need to make our own cartridge. Let's try and remake the 50 or the 45, excuse me. And yeah. they made the 45 gap. And it, you are absolutely right. It did not catch on at all. No. I mean, the 357 SIG 
is still in use by some law enforcement departments. Mm-hmm. I think the 45 GAP has a couple stragglers, like maybe the East Ishkabibble Highway Patrol still uses it. <laughs> but uh, I would, for you know, for all its advantages, and it does have some cockpits, have some good ideas. For all its advantages, do not buy a 45 GAP pistol. You are going to be frustrated at the ammo store. Yeah, you, you think it's hard to find 40 ammo? Try finding 45 gap. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, you, you're going to have to special order that stuff. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, that pretty much covers it. So, you know, Dave, kind of what, what are your final thoughts on 40 versus 45? Of course, you know, we're not going to say one's better than the other. I might. Uh, but, uh, you know, what are your final thoughts on it? Well, look, I mean, as far as just dedicated center fire handgun cartridges go, these are always going to be in the top five, at least for the next couple of decades. You, you'll do fine with either. Ultimately, I got to come down a favor of 45 ACP and not just because I'm trying to endear myself to you. Uh, the lower magazine capacity is a problem. But how how proud are you going to be to carry a 1911? Really? Yeah. The the handgun of, of world wars and and i mean gosh just when people picture a handgun they picture a 1911 i know people don't know about guns call every gun a glock but they probably picture a 1911 when they picture a handgun and that's just how influential and important the all-american cartridge is couldn't have said it better myself uh, I mean, you know, we have a handgun that has endured over a hundred years, uh, and it is, you know, a true, a truly American design. Uh, you know, born and raised, for lack of a better term. And yes, I'll err on the side of the forty-five if y'all haven't figured that out. Uh, but you know, for me, again, I like the way that it feels. Uh, when I shoot it, the recoil on a 40 is fairly snappy for a 45. It's more of what we would call a rolling recoil. So it's like, it's not all that real, like sharp force coming back. Mm -hmm. It's, it's more of an elongated feeling. And I think that that's a lot easier to control. I think that's energy impulse, recoil Mm -hmm. energy impulse you're talking about. And that's a whole separate thing from just standard recoil energy. Oh yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's just another facet of hands-on experience that you cannot, you cannot research away. Um, I feel like we've talked about the 1911 so much. We should point out that Glock and other other handgun manufacturers make really modern 45 ACP handguns. Absolutely. You can get that Glock platform. Yeah, the Glock 21 uh, is going to be your full-size, great, great firearm. I have one myself. I love it. Um, you know, of course, you have your 1911s from multiple manufacturers. You've got the Sig Sauer P20, uh, the M&P 45 from Smith & Wesson, the XD 45 mm-hmm. from Springfield. Pretty much every handgun manufacturer out there is going to have a 45 offering because it is just so popular. But the same could be said for 40 as well. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't want people to think they're committed to World War One tech if they're choosing the uh, 45 ACP. That's Although it's fair. great tech. It is. And you won't be disappointed if you get it. Trust me. Uh, but, you know, guys, that's going to wrap it up. So if you made it this far in the video, I really appreciate it. Make sure you click that like and subscribe button down below and be part of our community here at ammo.com as we continue to go through more and more calibers. So you are better prepared for the next time you hit the gun store. <laughs>